So the Acropolis, I mean, it means high city, right? Um, so it's a raised hill in the center of ancient Athens, um, which probably housed the core of the earliest layer of Athenian occupation. But by the time you get to the classical period, it's a monumental center, right? It's a place um, primarily for temples, but not exclusively for temples. It's a sacred site in the middle of the mundane city where one approaches and encounters the gods principally um, Athena Parthenos, the patron god of Athens, but not just her. You'll often find in um, classical Greek settlements that there's an Acropolis attached to important places. Um, you know, having a, having a hill in the middle of your city provides an initial defensive advantage. That's probably the origin of um, those hills being important in Greek cities. But um, like in Athens, um, those prominent bits of geography often get translated into prominent bits of sacred topography um, as the city develops right in the heart of ancient Athens, right? So um, if you think about Athens, it has a number of parts, right? It has, the, it has a port, which is some miles down the road at the Piraeus, right? And then there's a major road from the Piraeus into Athens proper, which is guarded um, in antiquity, at least, by a set of defensive walls. Um, and then um, the, habited, the inhabited part of the city of Athens um, sprawls around the Acropolis. Um, those, um, those high places in the center of ancient cities, particularly um, in the Greek world, are originally by origin defensive sites, and they still are, right? Um, the Acropolis is surrounded by a wall in classical antiquity. Um, though those walls serve a double purpose. They're not just a practical defensive measure. They're, um, they're drawn sacred boundaries. Temenos is the usual word for it. Um, you build a, a Temenos wall around um, any temple site to mark off the difference between this world, uh, the world that you and I inhabit, and then the kind of places where you would also encounter gods. Um, so it's a sacred boundary marking the holy place out from not the holy place. Every, every ancient city has a religious calendar, right? Um, so we're used to, in a monotheist world, of everyone being on the same calendar, right? You know, there's Easter and Christmas, etc. in a Christian context, and you always know when those are. In the ancient world, um, each city had its own religious calendar, right? That you meet the gods on their appropriate days. Um, and so the primary purpose of the Acropolis, at least in classical antiquity, is to enable that religious celebration of the gods. Again, you um, meet the gods at the place where they expect to be met, right? At their temple site, um, at the altar in front of their temple site on the appropriate days. Um, and you offer them sacrifice, right? You offer them um, a kind of honorific show of the, just how much you uh, respect and honor those divinities with the idea that in turn, those divinities will be pleased by your scrupulous performance of the expected rites and will then in turn bring prosperity to the city, right? And anti-prosperity to the city's enemies. an initial pre-Parthenon, as it's usually called in the scholarly literature, which the Persians wipe out when they sack the city in 480, um, you know, as the, the closing chapters of the Persian Wars. Um, after that improbable victory um, over the Persians, right, the Athenians, now wealthy because they just beat the most powerful empire in the world, um, rebuild um, the Parthenon and the rest of the Acropolis um, in grand style. But then the, those buildings will go on to be modified further into later Greek history in the Hellenistic period, then again in the Roman period. And the, you know, the Parthenon quite, you know, it's well known that it turns into a medieval church um, dedicated to the Virgin Mary. Um, and then ultimately um, the Parthenon is, is in its semi-ruined state um, because it serves as um, a store for Turkish gunpowder, um, which um, blows up in the early modern period. As, as far as ancient temples go, it's in pretty good shape, right? You can still see um, you can still see Athena's high altar um, in front to one side of the Parthenon. Um, and then you can very clearly see um, its uh, outer colonnade and you can still mark out quite clearly where the twin inner chambers were, the two cellas of the Parthenon.
So there's a sculptural program, though admittedly some of it you can see in the museum on site and some of it you have to go to London to see. And there's a bit of an international kerfluffle over whether those sculptures, the Elgin marbles as they're called for the Lord Elgin who bought them under mysterious circumstances in the 18th century, that um, whether those marbles should be kept in London or returned to Greece. But yeah, there's, um, so ultimately there's a fair bit of the building still to be seen. There are a variety of sculptural programs on the Parthenon. Um, the lowest uh, by height uh, portion of that uh, architectural program are the Metopes, which are these um, square panels depicting mythological combats. So, you know, the story, the, the story of the Amazons is told there, the story of the Lapiths and the Centaurs is told there, etc. And in, uh, in 2011, 2012, um, two or three more of these Metopes were uh, recovered as part um, of an excavation elsewhere on the Acropolis. And the idea was is that these sculptural programs which in the Christian Middle Ages carried very little cultural weight any longer. They were reused, right, as just raw building materials and incorporated into a wall. And so that discovery was relatively recent by the standards of these things. The, you know, the context of the Parthenon, right, is the Persian War, right? So prior to, in the, so in the earlier part of the fifth century, um, the Greek cities, right, which are politically disunited, um, they're independent operators, that, that the, this, this Greek world is invaded by the Persian Empire, first by Darius and then by son Xerxes. These are the most powerful emperors anywhere in the landscape, right? Those little Greek cities are true pipsqueaks by comparison to the mighty Persian Empire. And then, you know, you can follow along in Herodotus, but the story goes that um, those Greek cities managed to put aside their many and deeply held differences. And for the moment, right, um, in the 480s, they managed to um, uh, provide a kind of semi-unified defense against this couple of waves of Persian invasion. And although the Persian armies of Xerxes sack Athens, as I alluded to earlier, which is that sack is in 480. Ultimately, um, in the immediate aftermath of that sack, there are significant victories, principally the Athenian victory um, on the water, you know, within sight of the Acropolis, uh, the Battle of Salamis. And in the wake of the Battle of Salamis, and then the couple of victories that follow, the Persian Empire is defeated. And you, this, it's, a, it's an unthinkable outcome, right? It's a little like, I don't know, the soccer team from your middle school beating the Brazilian national team or something like that. It's a really, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a big deal. And um, in the process of this, Athens goes from being a place that's about to be incorporated into an empire into the architects of an amazing victory. And so with the money that is then taken as loot from the defeated Persians, um, partly, um, the Acropolis gets rebuilt. So the rebuilding happens in the 440s and is completed in the 430s. And the rebuilding of the temple of Athena Parthenos, patron goddess of Athens, is at the heart of that. And so the, um, the building then is in that way, it's a thank offering, right? It's a thank offering for the deliverance of Athens by the gods who clearly engineered this victory because how else would you explain it, right? And so, um, the, so we think, should think of the Parthenon in that context. 